Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, wherever you happen to be listening on this beautiful planet of Earth. Uh, this is Clint McKinley. I am here as a moderator for the continuation of the Rallyware series of executive roundtables, where we have discussions with leaders in our direct selling channel who are in positions of leadership and who are making decisions as it relates to technology and the roadmap for their companies with an eye always to increasing effectiveness in the sales force and uh, creating growth uh, in new ways in an era that is challenging in many respects and exciting in many others. So I'm delighted to have our two guests here. We'll start with some introductions. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce David Mullum. David is the Global Chief Sales Officer of USANA, a uh, legacy brand that everybody that touches direct selling has heard about or probably interacted with at some point. David is joining us today from his home in Sydney, Australia, where it is bright and early and it is already tomorrow. So David, we look for a lot of insights since you've already seen tomorrow. Yeah, thanks, man. Nice to see you. Welcome, David. Uh, we also have Ryan Thompson. Uh, Ryan Thompson is the president of a company called Actives, which has just celebrated their sixth anniversary. So congratulations to you and your co-founder, David Brown. Uh, Ryan, as president, has operational um, responsibilities and, of course, Salesforce responsibilities with a business that has found great success throughout Latin America, Ryan being bilingual and leading the charge as an executive and somebody who is no stranger to being in the field. So, Ryan, welcome to you as well. Thank you, Clint. Good to be here. Awesome. Well, guys, in this series, what we've been doing with, with uh, the guests we've had on is to ask some questions about technology. In the, in the direct selling world, uh, we are no better than the success of our sales force. We depend on an army of independent executives uh, who are entrepreneurial, who in some ways make their own rules and make their own luck. Of course, the company provides a, a great stable platform for them to succeed. And a part of that platform is always technology. And as the drumbeat of progress has continued in the world of technology, <clears throat> decisions, decisions, decisions have come into the C-suites of um, direct selling companies where the two of you sit. And so we appreciate you giving us a little bit of your time today to share some insight uh, on how you are facing some of these difficult questions and how your organiza organizations are navigating uh, the, the technology pull that always seems to be there to take us forward. So with that, we'll dive into some questions here. And I'd like to begin with priorities. You know, so much of it is about priorities. What does a company prioritize? How does it decide to invest? Where does it put dollars? And as it relates to technology, how do these priorities develop? So the first question, I'll, and I'll start um, maybe with you, Ryan. In terms of investment priorities, what areas really rank the highest in your company to transform? If you're looking for technology to help you, where are you yeah. looking for most of that help? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Clint. And uh, it's not a, a simple one to answer necessarily. It, it's always dependent on what phase of the company I found myself. So speaking of my current company, Actives, which is, uh, we're so, as you mentioned, celebrating six years uh, this month um, in business as a startup, primarily in Latin America. Mexico is our, our largest market by far. Uh, U.S. Hispanic is number two, and then we've got some Latin American com companies behind us. So where we are, really, um, our priorities are 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 driven by by you know, it, it really uh, a couple things. First, what can we do to simplify what our distributors do? Um, technology is very exciting. Um, it can get complicated and uh, can get sometimes distracting. So making sure that we align our um, uh, 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 priorities according to what does the field need you know there's we've had a lot of processes that require additional steps from enrollment processes to transacting uh preferred customer orders to uh transacting just sales um collecting money from people in in countries that um you know uh, maybe the populace doesn't really have access to credit cards so simplifying basic business process has been what has been our top priority thus far. Um, you know, our role is, as, a, as a direct selling company is to, is to ship product, manufacture and ship product and pay commissions. And so making sure that we simplify those processes as best we can so that our independent distributors can do their job, right? And be the promoters. So that that's really been the top priority. 
for us. So it seems like Occam's razor, the simple solution is, is the most right one. Right. And in your case, uh, activation of your sales force and meeting them where they are yeah. you know, in the economies where they play yeah. uh, seems to be a priority. Thank you for that on actives. Yeah. Uh, David, as you think about this um, older company, uh, a company that's more been around longer and has a, a wider global footprint, as you think of your uh, digital priorities, uh, what drives that uh, in terms of helping you make your decisions on where the transform digital transformation dollars should go? Yeah, I mean, as, a, as an older group, you know, 30 plus years, um, we have this varying community around the world in, in some markets with, with three generations, you know, literally having a third generation of a family coming through uh, a business. So you, you're dealing with um, so the, the, an aging population of leadership and an emerging population, all um, in different levels of technology. Um, and understanding, and so you, you you need to take all of that into account. And the other part of the, the matrix, of course, is the cultural diversity that we have across all of the 20 plus markets, 26 markets that we have, um, the oldest being in the United States and the newest soon to launch in India. And so, um, and we have a, a significant business in mainland China. And so there is all of this variation of um, cultural technology you know what what needs to happen in in uh, for the Korean market to really resonate with the Koreans is quite different than what we need to do in India or what we need to do in Australia. But I think I you know I totally agree that what was said before is it's the simplification then becomes really central. It becomes so important for us. And so, out of priorities, a couple of things for us: the filters of of um, simplification and obviously speed. And relevance, making sure that we're in touch with what's happening in the marketplace. I think um, distributors and consumers alike, um, you know, look at they measure they measure the competition is not necessarily the other direct selling companies. Um, they're looking at the experiences. So I mean, that's what we need to do. We're going to deliver these these wonderful experiences for people at the level that they need, taking into account all of the things I just. Um, talked about, and they measure their the experience level, if you like, or the expectation comes from their day to day with dealing with their bank, dealing with their local grocer, dealing with their online shopping experience, particularly after the Amazonification of the world. So there's all of those things at play, and so the priorities if you think about simplification, relevance, and speed, um, those three things, and then bringing all of those pieces together. Um, and, and all of the all of the macro stuff around the Usana world, um, that's pretty much how we how we uh, get gather and prioritize. So simplification, relevance, and speed. Uh, I heard that. I also heard you mention something that I want to linger on for a minute, and I'll ask Ryan about this too. You mentioned a, a bit of an age gap, or um, you know, a generational uh, gap, where you have people that are third generation Usana. Uh, you know, people now coming in, born into USANA homes where my grandpa did it and my mom did it and now I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with that as it relates? There's a bit of a digital divide, right? Where you have the older people and the younger, the gen, the the, the greatest generation that's been called baby boomers. And then you look at Gen Z and you look at some of us, the three of us maybe in the middle in our generation trying to hold it all together. Um, how do you bring simplicity, relevance and speed and serve that up to people that are, you know, at different ages of life and at different tolerances for, you know, using their phone or or learning how to use apps. I, I think I'm you're very kind. Yeah. I think you're very kind on the age thing. I think I'm probably the oldest dude in the group. So, <laughs> um, but you know, I think that you know my experience in in direct selling started in the really in in the late '60s '70s. With my my dad was the first general manager of Amway in Australia in 1972, I think. And then we ended up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, living there, you know, as a teenager, growing up in that space and we're having worked there and Mary Kay Nutramedics, Dawling Kindersley and a number of companies. And outside of the, you know, I've worked in, in uh, hospitality, um, property development and, and sort of the tourism arena. And I think regardless of whatever technology was happening at the time, the, the connection with um, with the field, with our distributors, 
um, was remains primary. And I don't think it matters which generation. Yeah, you probably have to connect differently, and there's different th ways that we need to communicate. Um, and uh, you know, when when uh, we we were growing, when I was growing up, certainly there were two groups of people: there were old people, and then there were young people. And now there's these multiple groups of people, whether it's Gen this or Gen that, um, that are that are categorised within these very small time frames, two or three years, or five years. And and so having had six children, uh, spanning 20, 20 years, sort of difference in in ages, regardless of of how they want to be communicated with, they they need to be communicated with. Mm. Um, uh, and I think the key to it uh, certainly is we're getting older as a company is to be um, more proficient in that, um, to be um, transparent. I mean, trust is our currency, right? As, an, as, a, as a company, as an industry, trust is the thing that makes or breaks us as a company. And so, um, th therefore, our communication around that becomes absolutely paramount. Yeah. Interesting. You have six children of your own. Um, so, you, uh, I have five. Ryan, I think you have a gaggle or a few, four. Yeah. So uh, here we are, uh, dads, uh, watching our own children grow up in these generations and uh, having that inform maybe how we engage a little bit more with how to communicate. Ryan, I know you have something like this as well with, with leaders who are more seasoned in age yeah. and those who are chomping at the bit to make a name for themselves. Uh, how, how do you deal with getting them on the same page in terms of accepting the technology that you plan to roll out? Well, it's an ongo ongoing challenge. Um, I won't uh, be uh, so brash to say that we have it 100% figured out. Um, and it seems to be a challenge that um, uh, I've always been involved with back to the mid 90s. Um, I, I was a, sorry, I spent eight years at a company called New Skin. Some people, uh, I'm sure many people know who that is. Um, and, uh, you know, we acquired a technology company when I was there. And I was managing a call center at the time, and we were trying to implement something. And it was, I mean, it was, it felt, uh, you know, very much like trying to, to fit a square peg in a round hole. And so ever since then, I've been sort of ch challenged by this issue of some people get it, some people are more sort of technologically native. And then you have segments of the distributor population or user population that just aren't. And so as a company, we have to try and figure out how do we, how do we, um, uh, you know, throw the big net out there and, and, and bring everybody in. What, what I'm finding lately um, uh, at ACT as my current company is that um, I've, I mean, I'm a big believer in letting the market decide. Um, the market will figure things out. Um, uh, there are certain things that we do need to push uh, uh, and push out there and pull from them, but just kind of watching them. So the younger, you know, we have a lot of, we have got a sort of a generation of 20 somethings right now that have joined my company that are that, that are rising quickly to the top um and they you know their their sweet spot is social media marketing and that is essentially all they do uh we have a, a big segment of our distributor population that are you know they're just they'll never touch it they'll never touch tiktok or instagram um they're kind of um you know good old-fashioned uh belly to belly eyeball eye, eyeball uh, excuse me eyeball the eyeball kneecap to kneecap um, you know, direct sellers, and and that works for them too. So when we evaluate technology, for me, the the most important thing is what what can I do to help them do their business in the in the specific way that they want to do it. Right, I'm going to let them market how they want to market. My priority is automation. Let let me help you automate what you do, and then when you automate what you do, let me help you systematize how you do it. Those are the, sort of the two driving principles that I I really adhere to, and 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 the corporate staff um, uh, at Actives. And so, you know, to the extent that they can market through social media, that they can or, or they can, you know, uh, hand out uh, samples and brochures. Um, you know how how people do business in Bolivia is quite different than how they do business in Chicago. Um, it's just you know there there's there's age differences, generational differences, and there's also other demographic uh, uh, drivers for why, you know, we need to kind of just have a, have a, have a very inclusive approach to, to what we offer. So um, technology needs to, to facilitate automation and, and system it, and it's helping them to systematize. And whether that is how we present, how we provide them 
you know, weekly training venues through Zoom or opportunity presentations or uh, product information um, outlets, just sort of a, a, a system that they can plug into and then provide them technology that allows them to automate. And like I said, you know, in my, in my opening comments, it, it easier said than done, but that's how we sort of uh, wrap our arms around uh, multiple generations, right? You know, if, if you're above 60, you can still have an auto ship. If you're under 60, you can still have an auto ship. Um, if you don't have a credit card, we'll go find a technology that allows you to still have an auto ship through OXO pay or 7-Eleven pay or some of the payment solutions that exist out there. And um, that that's that's been a big part of what we do to grow and to to learn to be successful. Great, great suggestions there on meeting the challenge of, of uh, different generations and cultures. Ryan, you mentioned the word automation a couple of times, and, it, and I think I want to linger there, and I'll come right back to you. And then Dave, um, is how do you decide what to automate and what not to automate? You know, it's it, it's a belly to belly business and it's a person to person business. And I think the three of us would probably agree that those axioms are remain yeah. valid. However, um, you, you said you needed automation and of course you need some and you need to bring people along um and and sometimes persuade and, and make the sale of how this would make their life better other times maybe it's laissez-faire let the market decide like you said yeah. but you, n- nonetheless there is this mean this need to automate some functions what matters to you when it comes to making automation decisions and how do you keep that the physical touch or the personal touch of direct selling how do you not violate that while doing while automating yeah it's a great question um, and I think that the, the answer will vary depending on what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there are, there are, you know, automization should simplify the distributor's job. It, it should simplify what they need to do, reduce the number of touches that are required by them. We know that the more uh, required touches, the more steps someone has to take, the, the, the unfortunately, the, the higher the likelihood that, that people are going to drop off. They're not going to go through with the enrollment, with the order whatever the case is. So, you know, it really is back to my very first comment. If it, if it serves to simplify process, then it's probably the right decision. If it serves to make things more convenient for corporate headquarters, but creates distractions or, or confuses the field. I mean, there's a lot of things that I would love to automate that I don't automate because uh, we just have a swath of our organization that that would be uh, disenfranchised. And so, you know, I, I, I look very, we have to look very carefully at, is this going to simplify what a distributor does or is it going to complicate it? So, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm probably being vague here because it depends on what we're talking about. If we're talking about automating, you know, uh, uh, or, uh, product reorders, or if we're talking about the automization of communications um, that have a specific, you know, weekly cadence or daily cadence to them, or social media postings, there are things like that that you can automate. But then there, you want to be able to step out of that and and make sure that you don't automate so much that suddenly you're a robot and and we don't have and we lose that personal interaction with them. Being able to interact with people real time if they are engaged in a social media contest, for example, is critical, right? You, you don't want bots sending autoresponders, right? You want you want real life uh, uh, members of your marketing department interacting, congratulating, recognizing that that human touch is important. So, I mean, that that's I, I think I'll stick with that answer. You know, no, I think you've got really to. Yeah, it's a defined point of view you have. And it's it's about simplicity in all things. It sounds like, including on what to automate, yeah. uh, what simplifies a person's life versus what distracts them, and mm-hmm. having the presence of mind to know that we're talking about the field. We're not talking about employees who would like their lives to be easier in the home That's office, right. which is also an important constituency. But I think you've got your your story, and it makes perfect sense, Dave. I'll ask you the same thing, and maybe you have something to add here. As you look at this sort of trend to automate, like simplify everything. And use every piece of technology that that uh, that I used to have to do to follow up, and now it can automatically happen. Um, I'm speaking talking specifically about the sales process now uh, of selling and and sponsoring. Uh, at, there's and keeping people going and getting beyond decay curves. Right, you, your company may know that after month three or four, attrition happens in one way or another, and you know where that decay curve falls off. 
like the temptation for some of us is to is to load up on technology in those areas where we think people are going to forget. Um, but that isn't always foolproof. Uh, fr fr from your standpoint, where do you what are your insights on this whole what to automate and what to let be natural in the human uh, in, in yeah. human relationships? I think Ryan, you know, covered it pretty much. I, I, I like what he said earlier about let, let the specific market kind of determine, you know, where, where you play, you know, where you win, um, because there are different needs within that space. Certainly we're discovering that in some places um, there's a preference to automate in a particular area, <clears throat> whether that's in, in, say, onboarding. And then how much do you do that? We have a, a pretty robust onboarding program um, which we're still in the early stages of the indicators are really good for that. Uh, in some countries, what we're doing is not enough and in others, it's too much. And so, you know, and, and a lot of that is automated and a lot of it is responses. Um, <clears throat> so I think automating at pace is really important. You know, pick your, pick the pace that you need to work at, determine that. I think that's a really important value to have and understand that <clears throat> certainly um, you know, so many parts of our, our industry, uh, the one size fits all that used to work sort of 10 years ago. Um, it just doesn't exist anymore. And I think as, as a, we've, as an older company, one of the great, greater things that we've done more recently is really understanding that, um, further internationalizing our business with the technology in mind, making sure that we do it at pace, depending on the place that we're in, and I think as, as Ryan's also saying, is what not to automate. Um, you know, for me, I don't, I don't think you should ever, um, and we did this, and I think we, we paid for it, um, and we're moving totally the opposite direction is in the area of recognition. Again, as Ryan's talking about, I just don't think you can automate that because that's not how, that's not what recognition is about. Recognition is personal. And it's, again, it's one of our big, it's one of our big go-to areas but because we do so much of it, we all think that it's easier just to automate that, and let that happen through um, particular um, automated programs, as opposed to where it really needs to happen is this interface that we do together. And so I think it's it's really important to think about where is it that we don't automate just as much as it is is about where we where we do automate. Thank you. Very insightful answer. Okay, got a quick one for you guys. Uh, just a quick yes or no leaderboards fan or not a fan as ah. we as we talk about automating recognition do you like them i love them <laughs> I, I, I would say it depends I, I i would fall on the side of yes 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 for leaderboards. Okay. so in general we like leaderboards okay. and, and and we can say that that is a form of automated recognition because that gets populated but without the congratulatory phone call from some brass or from someone who's going to make them really feel connected to your brand. It's not a full recognition program. I what I'm hearing from you guys. There's, there's, there's spots for it. But, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Um, so speaking of the field and, and aligning with them uh, when you're making technology decisions and, and I, I'm reflecting back on this myself uh, from my time in similar positions and running Ruby ribbon, when we had to make platform decisions, for example, that I knew would affect everybody's life in the whole company, uh, everybody, every employee, every independent representative, tens of thousands of people are going to be touched by these choices, right? So then you say, uh, how do you align with your field leadership on the precipice of these decisions? Do you bring them in? Do you have a council of a handful that you trust uh, through many relationships or many experiences? You've grown to trust some of these people more than others do you bring them in for hey we're making a decision or we've made a decision or there comes a time for some persuasion at some point you know where you've got to talk about moving the company forward and what you're doing to for your infrastructure and to make things better for them um how do you align what's your, what's your approach to you know you've got a decision coming on the corporate side you might be looking at the money side and the financial side of the decision and the resource side but on the field side, you've got to be looking at, are they going to accept it? Are they going to adopt it? Or, I mean, is, are we going to be able to persuade effectively? Um, how do you interact with them when these decisions are going down and after they're made to ensure adoption? Uh, anything you can share from your experiences in those areas that you think might be helpful? We'll start with you, uh, uh, David. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I think 
like like all of us, we all have distributed councils and different groups. Um, and and I think yeah, the the primary importance of that is to make sure those people are the ones um, who've done it and are doing it at the moment. And often we get caught in that that space of having our legacy leaders in that world. And I think there's another opportunity for those people to be recognised and to be communicated with. Um, as you're talking about integrating new technology and new direction, I think again there's there's probably two two groups. There are the ones that really who is that who is that going to work with? I mean, it, it, for me, the shopping experience is a, is a primary arena that we have to be um, really exceptional at, and and we spend a lot of time at USANA. Just con that's a constant for us. It's all the time shifting and changing and moving because it's one of the things that consumers and our distributors deal with um, in their daily life every day. And they make that comparative. They're comparing it to this experience or that. And so it's really important that we're engaging at that level. But to your point, the engagement, the ultimately for someone to take it on board and help us take it to the marketplace, either through the district to, to our distributors or to our consumers, it's going to be from top down. It's going to be with our leaders. You know, no matter what we do, they've got to plug in this new thing and unplug something else. They've only got so much time. And whether it's um, a, a new platform or whether it's some new training technology or whether it's an, uh, a new promotional program, a digital version of the, the USANA story, whatever it may be, they've got to be convinced that that's going to bring higher value to them than what they're currently doing. And for me, that's probably the most important thing. And, and I'm sure... This, Ryan will say the same thing. You know, in every market, there's three or four key leaders who are significantly more influential than any of the other groups. And those, and rightly so, because they're the they're they're the leaders that you work with all of the time. They've had a long history of developing the business in that place, and and so paying lip service to them is not how it works. And, and in some in some cases, it takes quite a long time to have someone ultimately who is going to influence thousands of people to get up on either in a, in a digital stage or in a physical stage and say, this is this program will make a difference in your business. Because for them to shift into that space, they've really got to be convinced that I'm going to unplug this thing that I've done for the last three years. I'm going to plug this thing in that the company is saying is going to be really meaningful for us. And so, again, that relationship you know, it gets back to the previous question, what not to automate is your leadership connection. You can never automate that. It's got to be so personal that um, particularly if you want to aut automate, you've got, you've got to make sure that that alignment with the leadership country by country and in, in country, intra-country as well is, is very dynamic. Well, that's a quotable quote, uh, Dave, uh, about you can't automate your connection to your leadership. Uh, I'm not going to forget that. Thank you for that, Jim. Um, in, in certainly we know we have these councils, right, Ryan? I mean, obviously every company has distributor or leader councils, uh, but there's different philosophies and management of uh, how much reign you share. Is it is it command and control leadership or do you not make a choice until you have certain people persuaded? How do you manage those dynamics? Yeah. Well, you know, in contrast, I think to what, what, what David said, I, I've uh, stopped. We just, I like to surprise people. It's come up with the technology to launch. It. I'm, I'm kidding. That's, that's fine. I had to say that. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everybody. Yeah. 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 No, I, I, uh, uh, it, some, sometimes though, don't we wish we could just do that though? Right. Uh, no, I, I, oh, yeah. I agree hundred percent with everything, uh, uh, David was saying, um, I, you know, I, I maybe to add my own bit of color to it. Um, about two years ago, uh, we were ah, more than that three years ago or so, um, here at actives, there was this great new te technology, this tool that, um, uh, one of my people who's actually, he's, he's a very skilled, um, uh, marketing, uh, sort of uh, guru down in Mexico. We hired him. He's, uh, he's a, um, uh, yeah, he operates his own agency, social media marketing, and he's really in touch with like sort of the latest and greatest uh, uh, platforms. And so he developed something. We brought it in. We over the space of about six, uh, not, uh, about a year, he was getting it ready, branding it. Um, and then we had our leaders begin to test this. And this was uh, sort of a marketing tool. It, it integrated a variety of social media platforms so that you could run a campaign, a single campaign 
and it would it, you it, it would be optimized across whichever platform you selected including all of them so it's really a, a, a sort of a cutting edge tool after testing this with a lot of leaders um I, I noticed that a few of them they just lost interest right and they kind of it was taking them away from their bread and butter from just what they what they were what they did to get to where they were and a few of them, you know, a handful kept going at it, kept running campaigns, um, ran into issues. But the feedback that they gave me was, you know, the truth is, is I spent a lot of time, I, I spent a lot of time trying to learn this system. There's no way that the masses are going to be able to integrate this. There's no way that the that the rank and file will be able to learn this system. And so their recommendation to me was that we scrap it. And Rightly so. I mean, I, I saw that coming. And so we never launched it. Um, and it was sort of lost investment. But had we not uh, sort of had our top leaders just try and take it for a test run, um, you know, over and over and over again and see if they could, uh, could deliver results. Had we not done that, we, we, we kind of avoided a, a bullet in that. It, I think we all know that it would distract the field. People leave the co companies when they when they when they work hard and and and, and don't achieve success. So, um, you know, working hand hand in glove with with field leaders, um, quite literally on everything. Now, there's not they they can't test everything, but you know, I think it's a best practice to keep them informed. Just say, look, at this is sort of the direction we're working on improving the back office so that it can do this. We're, we're we're looking at um, improving, you know, the um, the virtual catalog so that it does this, um, and then to when when possible have them have them tested. And probably the, the 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 measure of a company is whether you're able and capable and willing to scrap something that is gonna that that's, that uh, you know could potentially jeopardize your field. So I hate scrapping things that we've uh, sunk money into and time and development into, but sometimes you have to do it and you've got to, you've got to pull the plug before you launch. Um, and I, the last thing I'll say on to that point is um, previous companies to this, probably three or four, or even five companies, seems like every company um, made a mistake in getting really excited about you know the newest shiny object you know in turn in technology launched it you know from the main stage at a convention or, or an academy or, or 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 what what have you and only to have it eventually fall flat on, on on its face for distributors to get distracted for distributors to lose money and so um the discipline of vetting a new technology is as important if not more important than the technology itself um, we on the corporate side work are constantly, I'm sure David would agree with this, bombarded by many, many, many um, uh, uh, third party tech companies with with the newest, you know, the newest orange, the newest Apple, the newest, you know, it piece of tech. And and uh, over the years, I, I feel like I've. I don't want to say have become jaded, but, you know, have quite thick skin just as far as the vetting process is concerned we you have to have the discipline to know what to look for and then the discipline to say no or to even do an about face prior to releasing a technology that, that could potentially slow create drag on your growth um, well, i think it, that story elucidates I, I think what you and david have been saying which is uh, without the alignment with the the top people that you work with every day about everything you will fall on your face and you know part of any decision of launching a new technology involves a carefully uh, planned approach with your field uh, to make sure that you are fully aligned. Um, and I think, Ryan, I've been in some of those moments too. They're dicey. When you wake up and you realize I haven't aligned with the field like I should have, that's not a happy moment. And I think if you go through that once or twice, you don't go through it again. Right. Uh, yeah. they're, they're, they're amazing experiences. Dave, before we move on to a new topic, anything else you want to add to this or, or you think we've spoken the truth? Yeah, I, I look. I think the um, I, I think that um, we've all had that experience with the leaders where uh, something different is seen as change, mm -hmm. as opposed to innovation. And I think, uh, particularly for our for our leaders, it's a really tough space. And and you know whether it's something to do with the comp plan or uh, particularly when it's technology, 
um, unless it's so simply explained and and something that they're already dealing with in the day to day life that it's a it's a movement into that. Um, it always seems like it's very disruptive. And to Ryan's point, <clears throat> you know, it's not just about the company deciding to do make a particular move. It's really the second piece of that is how do you integrate that? What is it seen as? Is it change? Is it different? Or is it innovation that's acceptable? And so that process, that finite little process, that junction point's really, really important. I think with all of the things that we're talking, speaking about, you know, and, and I've had the fortunate experience of, of being a distributor and, and working as one in, in a previous experience in a startup. And so having been at that junction point where you're sitting across the table from someone or you're on the phone to someone or you're doing a Zoom with someone trying to either sell them a product or have them join your team at that particular, that moment in time for the company to really understand what's happening in that moment and how technology plays a part in that, I think is becoming probably more important than anything else. It's that junction point where I'm doing this, I've got this one-on-one -on -one interaction, I'm getting things started, either a new consumer or a new distributor. Um, and how are all of these things that the company's bombarded me with coming to action, coming into play? How am I using that? What's working, what's not? Um, because I don't know if we truly understand at that moment in time, what's going on in that 20 minute space that either makes it or breaks it. And I think for, for us as, as regardless of the size of the company, in fact, I think when the companies uh, are starting up and a little bit smaller, it's easier to, to understand that. And it is for, um, for, for the older, older companies and those that are in uh, some diverse markets. It's that flashpoint. It's that moment of, yeah. the moment of truth call i mean you're, you're going to make a decision right then and uh, is the company's system that it in its office thinks is great really additive in the moment of truth where the rubber hits the road in our business model those are great takes thank you all so much it's it, it for both of you that this really is um sometimes with technology there's a big focus on what does it do and what are the features but most of our conversation today has not been about that we all know what the the features are that we need it's like reading ingredients right but in order for the application and adoption to work, this is the stuff that you've both yeah. been talking about. And it's very instructive, maybe a reminder to many people, but hopefully a wake up call to other organizations uh, to remember these important steps. Uh, let's jump ahead to a topic in our final 10 minutes or so uh, that is a little juicy. Um, you know, everybody's talking about AI ever since the Steven Spielberg movie. And it's hard to believe it's been that long mm -hmm. that he actually made a movie about that. Uh, prescient, I'd say. And and now, David, when you and I were at the World Federation Conference in Dubai uh, a few weeks ago, we heard from some you know imminent speakers on this topic who had a lot of interesting things to say. But what I'm interested in is with the two of you and where you sit is you look at all the things that it brings to the table, that some of it is automation. Some of it is doing some pre-work for you uh, that just gets served up to you. Um, what what are you bullish about? What are you bearish about uh, as, as you consider it? I mean, I'll give you a couple things to think about as you get your answers ready. Sales training and methodology, the business model itself, building sustained growth. How about company knowledge base? You know, what do we know in our company? What about predictive forecasting, right? What about better customer service, delivery of product? Ryan, you said one of our most important things is to deliver products and ship them on time operational effectiveness the pro probably some of your co your coworkers and your c-suites are thinking about a lot of those things but what i would add to that is the the effectiveness of the sales force itself which is the gooey center of the whole business model and are you bullish bearish what are you most excited about or looking forward to what's your overall temperature your barometer inside of you as this topic goes up and as you know the tools that are already being pitched to you that are already available. And some of you are, both of you are probably using AI in a lot of places that are not so sexy in your organization, but are also very effective. As, as we think about the sales organization though, what's going on in both of your heads? Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Ryan. Well, uh, you know, truthfully for me, the, the jury is still out a bit. Um, it, re, it, it, it I, I, there, there's tremendous potential. There's a huge future with AI, um, both for the uh, positive in, in terms of, things that would be positive and negative, I think. Um, 
the reason why the jury's out for me a bit, Clint, is it is um, eerily familiar. And it reminds me so much of 2006, 2007, when you and I worked together, 2008, 2009, 2010, when out of the work, woodwork came lots of companies saying, look, we, we helped this company go from zero to 100 million a year because we uh, unleashed this back then. What, what, was, what, they, what do they call it? Uh, sort of like a social media. They didn't call it social media marketing tool, but something akin to that. And I can remember sitting out with companies. I, I don't want to say their names, but I, I'm tempted uh, to say their names <laughs> that we sat down and met with that said we're responsible David and I know this. those guys too I think yeah 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 I'm sure you do I'm sure you do and I'm sure everyone watching this know you know knows who I'm talking to but these companies that that would take credit for the success of of one company say no we provided them this this technology platform and they grew from you know zero to, to x and um I was skeptical was skeptical then they it sounded great but for those of us who actually hired these companies, incorporating them, we know that they didn't work, right? We know that, you know, they, they, that there was a lot that still needed to be worked out in the details. Today, social media marketing is, is far adrift from the platforms that were being presented to us back in 2009, 2010. And so when we talk about AI today, it, for me in this industry and with a consumer goods company that relies, you know, 100% on a volunteer sales force, the jury is very much out as far as, you know, what benefit is it going to bring us? How is it going to enhance our business model? And, and now I'll just, you know, sort of get granular and cut to the chase, Clint. I think it's beneficial and I'm bullish with AI in as much as it can help you create a more consistent, steady drumbeat around your messaging mm. and branding and brand recognition. Right. Mm -hmm. Which is which we know is a very, very important part of any consumer goods company, let alone a direct selling company. Right. So in terms of crafting messages, using it with Mark, and we've had some incredible experiences with it actually here at Actives, um, where we, we are a, 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 you know, primarily a Spanish speaking company right now. We have inroads into uh, U.S. English, into Japan. Uh, some into um, some Mandarin speaking um, uh, areas, uh, Taiwan. And, and so using AI to facilitate um, things that would be very difficult for us to do, that's been great. Um, it's allowed us to have a, maybe a larger footprint in terms of messaging and our marketing. Um, as far as other aspects of it, we, we've not incorporated a whole, a whole lot. And I'm bearish in as much as I don't want to be a guinea pig and I won't let our distributors be a guinea pig to, um, you know, to this, this whole world of AI until we really understand what it does, what it's capable of doing. Predictive forecasting and things like that, I think are great. Um, you know, but there is, as you and I and David know, you know, the, the aspects around um, seasonalities and things that are highly subjective that go into forecasting, forecasting, you know, perhaps at some point AI will be able to do that. Um, but uh, forecasting is company, market, region specific, it's product line specific, it's demographic specific. And so for me, the jury's out. I, I hope my, my response made some sense. I, 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 no, I think so. Esoteric, but well, but something's new. There's there's yeah. wisdom in being cautious, and but you're also giving props to where it's helped you. And it seems yeah. like your mind is open. If the jury is out, the mind is open uh, with concerns. Uh, David, where do you land? Yeah, I'm I'm, and I feel we're we're probably in the same space together on that. I think Maury, uh Terence Terence Maury was the speaker at. Um, he did a great job, and I'd I'd highly recommend his. His discussion, you can see that on YouTube and different spots um, from the World Federation. I think he spoke really clearly about it, um, outlaying and, and, you know, example after example of where AI is affecting and impacting in, in various areas of, of, the, um, of, the, of the, the cycle of any company. Um, but again, it came down to trust. It's, that's the that's the big area around this, mm. um, where we've got to be very careful. I think even from a productivity perspective, there's some really great 
um, IA initi AI initiatives that um, still um, push on the trust boundary with the people that you work with. And I think we've got to be very careful about that. I mean, we're always measuring, again, who's going to be, how can you be more effective at that, at that flashpoint, at that junction point? Um, and how could AI help us in that particular space, but not to the point where it's um, uh, where it's causing distrust with our distributors at that particular point. Um, and so, yeah, I think we've got, with, I'm certainly not an, the expert in it. Definitely, we, you've got to have an, an AI strategy and maybe the strategy is not to do anything, but at least that's a strategy, right? But I think you've got to have a, an AI strategy that is part of the priorities list. Um, that as your prior as as a company, small or big, um, that that where that um, where it sits in the priorities, and that you are reviewing all of the time. I think the biggest area that keeps coming up is just in productivity. You know, how can you how can you become more productive? And so it's little pieces at a time in the productivity, and maybe that should be the filter. I think to, to Ryan's point, expecting it to grow your business, this, our distributors grow our business. They're the, they're the connector. If we're in the direct selling, network marketing, whatever you want to call it, industry, that's the channel. Those are the people. The AI channel is a different one, but AI can bring productivity to the way in which we manage our day-to-day -day businesses. Yeah. But again, I think we've got to step really cautiously. Um, there'll, be, there'll be enough that'll take us down the river faster. It'll be fine. Yes, I think I think you're both aligned on this. And I think what I'm hearing you saying is productivity is sticking out. If there's a way to make us more productive in the field, if there's a way to make that flashpoint of asking for the order or sponsorship conversations more effective um, and more productive, then your ears are open. And uh, but there's this reticence to, to, to go gung ho uh, and to not have your field be a guinea pig, as you say, Ryan. So great sentiments, guys. Thank you. That really opens up. And I, I think that there's a sense in the people like the two of you who are sitting in the C-suites of some of the great companies in our business that um, there is a, a mixture. Maybe there's a there's a bull and a bear going on. It's like the comedy masks, smiling and crying. And, you know, people are looking at this and deciding where to go. David, you're saying productivity. Ryan, um, you're saying for the sales force, it's got to be additive. And it's not the company, it's not the vendor that makes it go. It's the field that makes it go. And it has to 100% make them more effective in what they do and not distracted. Great points, guys. I hope everybody who's making technology is listening. Um, really good insights. And the time we have left, which is now very short, uh, I'm going to skip over some questions. We've had some great ones. But uh, I want to just get to the end here with one final question for both of you as we prepare to wrap. Um, would love to hear a success story from somebody in your organization. Tell us the story of uh, a brief story of a woman, a man, um, uh, a regular person, a special person, doesn't matter. Somebody in your organization that uh, comes to your mind when you think about how this should really look when somebody is ginning in the business and they're doing well and they're and they're technology capable how has that technology helped them be successful in direct selling in 2023 can you give us a story maybe a distributor from each of your companies that you can that speaking of recognition that you can recognize in this forum and use it as an example of what you uh, what you think is uh, a good thing happening in your field with this type of technology uh Ryan start with you sure sure um uh, yes. And, you know, the technology that I'll, I'll be talking about here with this story is uh, sort of social media marketing. And when we launched uh, this company, Actives, uh, six, really exactly six years ago, you know, there was social media marketing. People were trying things and there were there was a, there were a lot of, you know, great ideas out there and vendors selling different platforms. And, and um, this company, just like, you know, many, if not all other companies have had a flurry of distributors who are really on board with that and, 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 and trying to um, uh, learn how to do successful campaigns, right? Lead gen campaigns, find new people, uh, in, increase their footprint um, in, in uh, you know, in, in e-commerce. And uh, I want, don't want to say they failed, but they didn't really become successful using a lot of these prepackaged platforms. The success story really has come with some of them just 
doing their own sort of social media marketing campaigns, um, like step, stepping uh, outside of these prepackaged platforms that were being marketed and sold to us and saying, you know what, I can just do my own personal videos and I'll post them to Instagram or I'll post them to TikTok or, uh, you know, one, you know, a, a woman named Noemi was very successful on Facebook, uh, a woman named Lucy of Chiapas, Mexico, really successful at, um, at uh, TikTok initially. And then, a, and then a 22 year old uh, young lady named Grecia um, using Instagram. So three, I mean, three uh, women, um, you know, one 22, one probably in her, uh, the others in their forties, kind of figuring out how to navigate those waters. And um, the success story is that they have all um, sort of harnessed much of the potential that is there for using that technology to reach a massive number of people. So um, it's staggering and mind blowing to me. Like for me, my my mind has been opened uh, where before maybe it was a bit closed with the potential here um, I, it, on a regular basis. Each one of them, I mean, I, I speaking with Grecia, she enrolls about 30 people a month on some of our large product packs. And um, and that was pretty, pretty incredible, pretty eye opening. But then the quick reaction that I had that everyone had was, yeah, but is she duplicating or is she just out there selling stuff, right? Is she going to be doing that for how many years is she going to want to do that if there's not duplication from other distributors? Well, lo and behold, you know, she has found people who, like her, understand how to uh, how to harness the potential of that technology. And she's now duplicating and she has an army of mostly young women who are just doing an incredible job, really cleaning up on now Instagram and TikTok. And it has sort of proliferated away from these three individuals, you know, Grecia and Lucy and Noemi to include, uh, I would say not thousands, my company's not that big, but many hundreds of distributors and actives who this is their bread and butter. They're, they've been successful at really bringing in um, dozens and dozens of new enrollments each month. And so, my, like I said, I'm, I've been, I'm sold. Uh, my eyes have been opened and now I'm really kind of open to, to possibilities uh, because I've been c convinced that my, my, my prejudgment of that, of those technology platforms is, was wrong. Right. And so th that's, uh, that's probably my biggest success story that I can share is that, you know, they, they have figured it out on their own. It didn't take the company to go buy, and, and integrate some marketing platform for them. They did it on themselves. And, and that's why, why I, I do believe the market will determine and decide for themselves what works and what doesn't work. And um, that that's true at a very, at an individual basis, right? At a, I'm sorry, at an individual level. So congratulations to these three women, um, Grecia, Noemi, and who was the third? Lucy. Lucy, Lucy that's right. Uh, congratulations to them. And now if you do different technology in the future, you know who you're talking to about it, right? I mean, you have right. yeah. some solid stars that are going to help guide you as you make some decisions. David, real quick, we'll end with you. Uh, anyone you'd like to highlight at USANA who you feel has made you proud with this? Oh, there's so many. I was thinking about the, the COVID era, you know, which really pushed people, you know, it wasn't, there were already platforms and a lot of them were pretty crappy. You think about where Zoom was in those days. Right. And so, you know, there's a lot of technology emerging and I, and, and I, for the life of me, can't remember the name. So I apologize, but where they were doing a sip and scrub, you know, how do you do it? How do you do a skincare um, event? Well, you do it in your pajamas, you get a couple of hundred people drinking booze at the same time. And not that I'm advocating that, but anyway, <laughs> um, they're drinking, having a glass of wine and doing a scrub thing. Right. And, and so I, and there's an example in, in China of one of our leaders, just authentic. I think that's probably the, the, it's not the platform because we've got plenty of leaders who have lost their way in building their brand and, and, you know, they've, they've lost the original intention where it's moved from being a portal of communication to being one where I'm self advocating and, and recognizing myself. I think one couple in the United States that come to mind, they're Crystal and Jared Krebs um, in Texas, just phenomenal um, a couple. And, they're just so authentic and they're fun to watch. They're fun to watch them do what they do at home. And, and um, you know, when they're doing a meeting and they're doing a broadcast and they've got a few people in their living room and, and it's just this flow of authenticity 
that's duplicatable to Ryan's point. And, you know, they're, they're con they've consistently grown their business year on year through really tough times, but just really embracing, not overtly, because they're still doing all of the other things, but it's this really authentic space that people can look into and go, that's just a regular person and I can be like that. And I think that's the key in this space is making sure that it's real and more and more we're seeing that in social social media, social selling, whatever that, that space is, is the authenticity around it. So authenticity has got to come through and you got to be relatable. And that's Crystal and what was her husband's name? Jared, Jared Krebs. Crystal and Jared Krebs from Texas. Congratulations to those USANA leaders who have got the attention of their big CSO over in Australia. Uh, great stories. Thank you both, gentlemen. Uh, so we're going to call this a wrap. Uh, it's, my, my gosh, I feel like we could go for a few more hours, but we're, we all have things to do. I want to thank Rallyware, the sponsor of this webinar. Thank you, Rallyware, for putting your stick in the ground and saying that you want to host conversations about technology wherever they go, um, because you never know where they're going to go. Uh, but you bring thought leaders on and you ask the questions and you see what the temperature is. And thank you both uh, for agreeing to join this Rallyware panel. And thank you for myself to Rallyware for asking me to host. I hope this has been illuminating to everybody. Um, these are leaders who are getting it done in companies with different lengths and sizes, but both with a successful track record. Did you notice all the agree uh, agreements they had, everybody? Uh, they didn't seem to disagree on much. And I think that that's a big takeaway for me, is when you look at the way that these questions are answered and the way that people who are imminent in the field are dealing with it today. Thank you both. I wish you both success. Cheers to you, Sana. Cheers to Actives. I hope you both nail it big. And hello to your friends that I have in both of those companies. Wishing you both the best. Thank you, David. And thank you, Ryan. Thanks. Right. Cheers. Thank you, Clint. Thanks, Thanks, David. Take thank care. Everyone. Great day. Cheers. See you, mate.